In 1995, Toho ended the Godzilla series with Godzilla vs. Destroya, giving TriStar Pictures room to forge ahead with the long-dormant American film, which at that point had been in production hell for years. Hot off the success of Independence Day, writer-director duo Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich were hired to put their own personal stamp on the character, and were determined to reinvent him for American audiences. And so sporting state-of-the-art special effects and supported by an expansive marketing campaign, 1998 finally saw the release of the long-awaited American Godzilla film, simply titled Godzilla, a film that would go on to have profound effects on the franchise going forward. When a Japanese fishing vessel is attacked in the South Pacific, NRC scientist Nick Tatopoulos is reassigned by the U.S. government to figure out what it could be. Theorized to be a new species created by nuclear tests in French Polynesia, the creature comes ashore in New York, displacing millions of people and throwing the city into chaos. As the military continuously fails to contain the beast, Nick and a team of French Secret Service men venture into the city to find its lair, where they discover it has laid eggs. It then becomes a race against time to wipe it out before a new species is born. There is no film in the Godzilla franchise more detested than the 1998 American Godzilla. For many fans, it is an abomination, a film that fails to capture any of the spirit of the Japanese films and translate it for American moviegoers. This is mostly true, but not exactly accurate, as the first 20 or so minutes makes a good first impression, playing fairly close to the tone and structure of the original film, so much so that first-time viewers may be wondering what all the fuss is about. Give it time though, because the longer the film goes on, and once Godzilla Godzilla is revealed in full, it's all downhill, revealing an unremarkable, soulless reimagining that fails to understand its own title character. Indeed, Godzilla's biggest failing is Godzilla itself. Stripped of the personality, abilities, and thematic power that define the original, here he is nothing more than an animal, an innocent, overgrown critter who's come to New York to nest. While the creature does elicit sympathy, it has none of the charm or character that made him popular in the first place. This effect is multiplied a thousandfold by a design that, while interesting in its own right, strays too far from the traditional look to be comfortable calling Godzilla. It's a shame, because in another movie, this monster would excel, but here it merely calls attention to itself. It doesn't help that Godzilla 98 is bogged down with a rather dull and plotting script that fails to excel in the most basics of the genre. Those looking to scratch their itch for action and destruction won't find it here, with the exception being Godzilla's first arrival, a decently shot set piece that uses perspective to keep the monster hidden. Aside from this, it's lots of running and hiding from helicopters, which gets old fast. The story grinds to a screeching halt in the third act, when Godzilla is pushed aside for an extended action beat involving hundreds of of velociraptor-like baby Godzillas. It's far too reminiscent of Jurassic Park, to the point where one could easily forget you're watching a kaiju movie. The characters are mostly fine, and to give the film credit, all fit into the traditional types you'd find in the Japanese films. The scientists, the reporter, the military man, they're all here. Despite fitting the dweeby nerd stereotype on paper, Matthew Broderick feels somewhat miscast as Nick Tatopoulos, while Maria Patillo is just the opposite as Audrey Timmons, whose wide-eyed, naive manner fits the characters so perfectly it's almost unbearable. Hank Azaria is likable enough as Animal, a cameraman with more courage than Zilla itself. And Finally, there's Jean Reno as Philippe Roche, who is easily the best and most charming character. Surrounding these four is an enormous cast of supporting players, some of which are actually fairly good, while others are insulting and great on your nerves. Back off, Jane. The special effects of Godzilla 98 are a mixed bag and have not aged well. While some shots of Godzilla look great when shrouded in rain and fog, others don't, sporting a weightless, glossy look that screams fake far more than a man in a suit does. Aside from that though, all of the miniature work and practical effects look fantastic. It makes you appreciate the kind of stunt performing that was involved that isn't as common in Hollywood filmmaking today. The score by David Arnold is also pretty good, if not a bit generic. It's both mysterious and awe-inspiring when appropriate and thus does a lot of the dramatic heavy lifting. This is good for the film, because on its own, it can't seem to stick to a given tone. While taking itself seriously, it's undermined by goofy one-liners and poorly timed jokes that robs it of any dramatic tension or suspense. That's a lot of fish.
Despite all of its problems, Godzilla 98 can be enjoyed if you cast aside any notions of it being a Godzilla movie. Viewed as a generic American monster movie, there are things to like about it. The monster is cool, some of the action is good, and the first act is legitimately atmospheric. However, the film is terribly paced, and most of the action scenes with the monster fail to be as creative as even the worst or cheapest Godzilla movie. While not the abomination it is often labeled as, as an adaptation meant to introduce the character to mainstream Western audiences, it's a huge misstep. A dark and arguably necessary chapter in the Godzilla franchise that is more fascinating than the movie itself. For more reviews and opinions on all things Godzilla, subscribe and stay tuned to Up From The Depths.